This morning's reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden, and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a child is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and evermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. This is actually a pretty important holiday in life of the church. The Sunday after Christmas is uh, National Assistant Pastor Preaching Day. So, <laughs> you guys can be here for that. Um, the, uh... <laughs> so, we've been doing a series on one passage in Isaiah, Isaiah 9, uh, which describes the coming of the Messiah. And each week we've discussed one of the different names that that passage gives to the Messiah. And each of, those, each of those names inherently is a promise to the church about the role he will play in our lives the amazing ways that Christ blesses us, his gospel changes really everything for us. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do this week, having gone through all that, is we're basically going to zoom out and look at the passage uh, as a whole. And what's interesting is, so certainly this is a passage of celebration, particularly for us on the other side of Christ coming, where we can see what a magnificent Savior he is. Uh, but what's complex about it is the context that this passage was written into in ancient Judah was very complex. It was a very, very messy situation. Uh, I think we all know what it's like to get ourselves into a situation that turns out to be much more messy or difficult than we expected. Uh, when I was living in India, I had two friends, uh, one an American named Susan, and the other, uh, one of the members of the church, I'm uh, sorry, members of our office, national members, Rockwell. And so Rockwell asked Susan for a very simple favor. He says, hey, I have a couple friends. Uh, can they stay with you for a night? And Susan says, yes, of course, right? This is an easy thing to do. You know, you put out some linens, maybe you buy some extra granola or yogurt, and you're good, right? That's it. That's all you need to do. Well, <laughs> what, what we find out in the coming days is, uh, first off, this, this, these friends, they're a couple, they're getting married. In fact, they're getting married the day they're supposed to be staying there. So this is their wedding night. And I swear this is an exaggeration. We find out that not only were they getting married, but they had both been put in arranged marriages by their family to other people. And so they are running away from their family to get married together. So this is a Romeo and Juliet kind of situation. So, as you can imagine, this was not what my friend Susan agreed to when she said, hey, I can host a couple of friends for a night, you know. Uh, well, I'll say this. I feel like sometimes it's easy as a Christian teacher to sort of whitewash the Christian faith and to say, oh, it's going to be much cleaner. You know, it's going to be this very clean, easy kind of thing. You know, I, and maybe other of you have done this at some point, it's like, it's easy to share a testimony where you're like, oh, my life used to be terrible, everything was difficult and hard, you know, I was on the street, you know, doing all this stuff, and then, and then I found Christ. And then afterwards, everything is easy and good and happy and perfect, right? But that's not what life looks like. That is certainly not the picture of the Bible paints about what the Christian life looks like. Mm -hmm. um, when I was working for a crew, I worked for a campus ministry, and in doing that, we had to raise all our own support, and so I had the, the joyful task of asking friends and family for money, which is, you know, a challenge. Uh, but it was funny, because in training, when they would talk about it, they made it sound, like, so easy and happy. You know, rainbows and butterflies, like, oh, you're going to see God bless you and work so many great things in your life, and like, okay, yes, absolutely, we saw I and my friends who were doing this saw God answer our prayers and do amazing things. But 
It was hard. <laughs> you know? Actually, one of my friends, he, uh, he, he had been stood up for three straight meetings, and he ended up like basically crying in the corner of a Starbucks with an older lady like comforting him, patting him on the shoulder. You know, like, it was hard. It was difficult. Uh, just because we knew we had God in the corner blessing us, caring for us, does not take away from the challenge of walking through that period of our Christian lives. Um, and so, this is very much what this passage is about. Uh, on one hand, it is the beautiful promises of God, but on the other hand, it is the reality of living in a very dark, difficult world. And so, before we dive in, let's pray. God, we love you. We rejoice to have a God like you with us, walking with us, through good, through bad. No matter what, we know we have a gospel that is that, that matters to us, that is relevant to us, that applies to us because it is so deep and wide. So great is the gospel of Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so, past the start. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness... On them has light shone. So, Israel is in a very big period of darkness. That is what Isaiah is preaching into. Uh, particularly, he's talking to the nation of Judah. Uh, and so, when we think about darkness, like it's definitely like has the sense of, of physical danger, right? There are there are scary things in the dark. Uh, or we know in reality, right, that there is a link between light and life, right? If the sun was suddenly snuffed out of existence, uh, things would get bad for us. It would get very cold here very quickly. Uh, photosynthesis would stop, so that's no more uh, air, you know, which is kind of important uh, to breathe. Uh, and even if we could build a building that had oxygen and air and food and all that stuff we need, uh, you know, uh, we, we actually rely on the sun for vitamin A and D, so like our bones would start to basically erode away. It would be bad, right? So the light is important. Uh, but what it's saying is, is this physical danger that the people of Judah are in. Uh, and what that means is, is that they, if you think you have bad neighbors, you know, up late at night, you know, making a lot of noise, putting trash out in the yard. Judah had worse neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, their neighbor was Assyria, which is basically one of the scariest, nastiest countries in human history. Uh, they would conquer a lot of other places, and their strategy was either uh, that country would surrender to them, or when they conquered the country, they would just commit horrible atrocities, so much so that no one would ever oppose them in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's who Judah is worried about. In large part. And so what happens is Judah's neighbors all, one, are like, hey, we need to band together. And then when Judah refuses to join their alliance, those countries actually attack Judah. And so what this passage is about, and what Isaiah about is in general, is the question of here is Judah in this horrible situation. They're fearing Assyria. They fear certainly their neighbors who are now at war them. Who do they turn to? So what does Isaiah says? Isaiah says in 41, fear not, for this is God talking. For I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. And so this passage that we're reading about a child that's going to be born, about this great light that's coming out of the end of the darkness, this is Isaiah trying to persuade the people of God in their distress to turn to him rather than to other saviors. <coughs> So it's really a twofold darkness. First, you have the darkness of the, the mortal danger that the people of Judah are in. And the second darkness is the darkness of their own unfaithfulness and disobedience. Because um, the problem is, as much as God and Isaiah want the people to turn from, to God in their distress, who do they turn to? Well, what's shocking is, as Israel is being attacked by its neighbors, you know who it turns to? Assyria. <laughs> so they go to this country that is horrible and evil, and... Um, the king of, of Judah says to them, to their king, I am your servant and your son. Come up and rescue me. They're using the same language that God says he's supposed to use for God. Uh, come and rescue me from these kings who are attacking us. And then what he does is he takes all of the gold and silver from the house of the Lord and gives it to the king of Assyria. Well, you can imagine how this turns out. <laughs> the king of Assyria takes it. Sure, he fights Israel's neighbors and then proceeds to invade Israel itself. Right? This was not a good savior to trust in. Uh, luckily for them, for us, for everyone, uh, God, though they were unfaithful, God continued to be faithful. And even though they had trusted in the, the power of the world, these evil men to save them, uh, God didn't betray them. God remained faithful to them. 
And so what does he say? He says, verse 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. And so, um, even though the people of Israel didn't do their part, God still fulfills this promise, doesn't he? In amazing ways. Now, what's really interesting about this passage, and maybe some of you have already picked up on it, is there's kind of a funny verb tense to it, right? Like, this is Isaiah writing in, like, 800 B.C., but he's saying, for us, to us, a child is born. It has already happened. The light has already extinguished the darkness, right? Which would be maybe surprising to the audience who's, like, who are looking around and seeing a lot of people who want to kill them, right? Like, I, it would be hard to feel like you're in the light at that point. And I, what I think this exposes is one of the, the central tension of this passage and really one of the central tensions of the Christian life is that there are two realities. On one hand, the people of God, us, have experienced God's amazing blessing. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean that we are spared from the difficulties and challenges of the world around us. Both of those things are true at the same time. Which the challenge then is then frequently, even now, knowing what God has done, we face this, this difficulty in the future, is we have to wait for God to work. We have to wait for the salvation still to come. Uh, waiting is hard. <laughs> in the phrase, you know, for Christmas, in the phrase, the, there's a great uh, expression. It says, slow is something as slow as Christmas. You know, we don't like to wait for the good thing at the end of the, the, end of the line. Uh, Maybe some of you, you know, you're stopped at someone at a stoplight and it take like a second too long to go. Maybe lay on your horn a little bit. Anyone, anyone here? Yeah. I heard some people were confessing it after the first service, so I know some of them do. You know, or you get into the elevator, you know, and the doors are closing and the, 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 the button you want to go into is already lit up, but you start jamming away at it, hoping it'll close a little faster, right? Um, <laughs> I saw a study that said 96% of people who order hot coffee will knowingly drink it too quickly, even knowing it's going to burn their mouth, uh, because they just can't wait for it to just cool down just a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, right, we, are, we are impatient. Uh, there's a great experiment uh, Stanford did like, years ago. Uh, it's called the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but the experiment is simple. They take kids, uh, arrange like three to ten basically, they put them in a room with a marshmallow. And they say, okay, you can either eat that marshmallow right away, or wait 15 minutes, and someone will come back and give you two marshmallows. And what's interesting is it's actually, what they did is then they tracked the kids for decades after that and see, saw how their ability to basically delay gratification affected their long-term success. And what was interesting is it, it was really one of the most important indicators. Mm -hmm. More than education level, more than, more than economic level, more than anything else, like this ability to like, like wait off 10 minutes to have a marshmallow was like, but what I think is funny is they've, they've done it subsequently, so there's like a video of this you can watch on YouTube, which I highly recommend, is watching these kids like do whatever they can not to eat this marshmallow and how soul-wrenching it is for them to hold off. You know, like some of the kids will just sit there and they'll just like glare at the marshmallow for like 15 minutes, you know. Uh, some of them will like cover their eyes as if it like it doesn't exist anymore. One kid, I thought this was pretty adorable, he would sit there and he would pet the marshmallow like a stuffed animal. <laughs> and my personal favorite was a lot of the kids, you know, they couldn't actually eat the marshmallow, so they would lick the table around the marshmallow <laughs> as if somehow that would satisfy this uncomfortable hunger. You know? <laughs> Waiting is hard. As much as we laugh at the kids, let's be honest, it is difficult for us in many ways. And yet, it, it, it's, it's, it's the posture of the believer. Psalm 40 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry wall and set my feet upon the rock, making my steps secure. We wait for God, which is hard. Uh, one application that I, I'm sort of reflecting on is I feel like frequently sitting in church, I don't know about for you, but it's hard for me to like just sit still for an hour and like listen to other people talk. I'm, I'm not great at that. Uh, and what I realize is so frequently I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I need to get to the next thing. You know, I have assignments to do, emails to answer, whatever. And what I need to remember is like, you know, where else do I have to be if not in the amidst, amidst the people of God, hearing the word, focusing my heart on him? Like, this is our home. 
Like, there is nowhere else that we need to be anxious to be in comparison to see in the community of the believers. Um, but in general, uh, there's this principle when it comes to Scripture called progressive revelation. And basically what it means is that the later parts of the Bible have a fuller picture and understanding of God's plan of grace, salvation, and faithfulness. See, what God's doing is he's steadily making promises and answering them. So each successive generation has seen more of what God is doing for his people. So first off, you have Abraham, right? He was promised a child. A great nation will come from him. And what does he have to do? He has to wait for it. Decades and decades, hoping that this child will come. What happens? God answers that that beautiful promise. And then a people is formed who ultimately fall into slavery in Egypt. And so what does God do? God... uh, uh, delivers them out of slavery and then promises them a new country for themselves. And what do they have to do? They have to wait for it. <laughs> 40 years in the wilderness. Not frequently because of their disobedience, but waits all the more they should do. And so 40 years they wait and then they are brought into the, the land of, uh, of Israel. Now ultimately their rebellion leads them into exile, but God promises them a deliverer. But what do they have to do? They have to wait 400 years in exile for that deliverer to come. And so at each stage, what is interesting is there's, there's two realities. is that they are the people of God who know that God has blessed them in amazing ways. Right? They can look back and say, wow, God gave a child to Abraham. He, he always comes through and he promises something. But they also have to basically still continue to wait for the promise to come. There's this difficulty of knowing God's character and his love, but still having to trust him through very difficult circumstances. And this is, to some degree, where we find ourselves as well. Now, we are chronologically more farther, and so we we have seen a much greater blessing, Christ coming, the promise of his spirit to be with believers. What a thing to praise and glorify God for. So we already have that, but we still are waiting for Christ's return. The fact that we have received those blessings doesn't mean that we still don't have to wait for the fulfillment of God's promises, to trust him through hard, difficulty, pain, all of that is still something we have to endure. And so, a lot of people will call it the already but not yet principle. We already have God's grace, but we do not yet have its fulfillment. And so we live in the middle of that to some degree. And so this is very difficult to still experience those fallen things. Particularly when our hearts are often wandering off in the wrong directions. Our minds cannot be trusted. There's a great uh, there's a great writer who I, I really enjoy named Lauren Winner. She's from Duke. And uh, she says this about our hearts, basically. She says, the theme that runs through many Christian conversations about sin is that we'll feel bad about it. If we mess up, we will feel wrecked with guilt, or even more likely, we will wake up in the morning feeling lonely and bereft. To be sure, that is sometimes true. Sometimes you feel ashamed or alienated or lonely. We're just playing down in the dumps. But sometimes it is not true. Um, Sometimes, even after messing up, a person we will feel uh, after messing up, a person will feel fantastic or neutral. It is curious that contemporary Christians often insist that we will necessarily feel bad. This is how sin works. It whispers to us about the goodness of something not good. It makes distortions feel good. It tells us we'd be better off with pleasure in hell than sanctification in heaven. Our feelings are just as fallen as every other part of creation, and therefore not wholly reliable. To acknowledge that a sinful act might feel good is not to say that sin is good. It is rather to say that our feelings are not always trustworthy. Here's the problem. We don't love what is good. We don't love what is good for us. If we did, broccoli would taste like steak, and steak would taste like broccoli. You know, great. And yet we live in this world where we need to eat, you know, cabbage and spinach, which tastes like the ground, you know, no matter how much dressing you put on them. And yet, you know, the steak, which tastes good, will, you know, make you not so happy. <laughs> That's the problem, right? And, and so this, the same is true with sin. And so uh, uh, Dr. Winter is saying, you know, there'll be sinful things for our life, which we're like, you know, rather than feeling bad, we're like, mm, no, that's, that's kind of good, actually. I, I like that. Not because the sin is good, but because our hearts are astray. Now, the flip side of this, I think, is even more important, which is sometimes the good things, the things that we should love, they, they don't, you know, it may not actually make you feel easy and good, you know. As much as the Christian life is God's blessing upon us, that doesn't make it easy to follow. Uh, one of the most pronounced examples of this is someone uh, named, well, who we all know, Mother Teresa, uh, who 
well, talk about someone who lived faithfully for 60 years, and yet her journals after she died reveals a woman who was uh, consumed by depression a lot of the time, feelings of doubt and loneliness and hurt. She received a call from God as a very young woman, and then to some degree felt some distance from him for a lot of what came after that, but still lived faithfully for him all those years. What an amazing, you know, act of faith. Uh, and this isn't to say that, you know, <laughs> we're sending you out into the world to feel lonely and broken constantly. You know, she's an extreme example to some degree. But it does say to some degree that the Christian experience, no matter how good, no matter how gracious, uh, will entail difficulty, hardship. Um, in part because our hearts don't always love what is good. Um, <laughs> I feel like teachers have to endure this, this difficulty a lot, right, where their job is like, can be kind of unpleasant in some ways. You know, they work sometimes 70 hours a week. You know, they have 30 kids to manage at a time. They don't get paid enough. They're bosses who are difficult, right? All these things to manage that are difficult. And so it makes it difficult to, I think, for them to love a job which is so good, right? They're, they're, they're giving such a blessing to their students, but it's hard to square those two things. Here's the reality. I think for us, the Christian life will not be easy because some degree our hearts are astray. We don't recognize what is good. We don't see God at work in our lives the way we could. Now, it's not because God isn't at work. It's not because he is not doing amazing things to transform us. It's because our sinful spirits don't recognize it. If we're either distracted by the world around us or just too consumed by negative emotions sometimes to appreciate it. So, what is the answer to this? <laughs> well, uh, verse 7 continues, Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Okay, two things to close. First, uh, I think this passage talks about God's constant, ever-increasing victories in our lives. And I think what this signals is that sometimes it's easy for us to have an all-or-nothing kind of approach to sin and, well, anything. You know, Whereas what we need to do is we need to recognize that God is changing us day by day by day. It's certainly something I recognize working a lot with um, college students who had a lot of addiction issues, uh, where you realize you, you just, you know, you don't go from, you know, being consumed by something to being completely free from it in a day. So what you have to do is you have to recognize each way in which God is steadily bringing you out of it, building new aspects of your life, leading you into new relationships, helping you have small little victories. Each of those need to be celebrated because God at work, and shouldn't be minimized by the fact that we are still sinful and broken and not complete. But to see what God is doing, not, not be consumed by fear that he hasn't yet done everything he's promised he will do. Second, I think this is really important, is this, we just need to be honest about the difficulty of the Christian life. Uh, I think it's, in a lot of cases, Christians will deny this, either theologically or just in practice. Like, there's, there's sort of a Christian theology, like a Christian perfectionism. Uh, in some churches, it's an official theology. They feel Christians can actually make their lives perfect. Uh, or, in, more commonly, they don't have that theology, but in practice, what do we do? We whitewash. We make things look good. Oh, everything's good, happy, whatever. We, we pretend. Uh, and I think in both cases, that can be problematic because, one, we're lying to ourselves, but also, two, where we can be hypocritical in the way we portray what it's like to live a Christian life. But, I think even more important is, is it's unnecessary. Because in Christ, we have a true Savior. We have a gospel that is wide enough to deal with any life context, any set of feelings, any set of burdens, any past actions and guilt that we have, that we're bringing to the table, we have a gospel that can handle it. We have a Savior who can handle it. Why? Because as Hebrew says, we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. He knows from first-hand experience what we are going through. Um, there's a great story uh, I heard from a, a pastor who said, uh, this guy's walking down the street when he falls in a hole. The walls are so, sleep, uh, so steep he can't get out. Now, a doctor passes by, and the guy shouts up, hey you, can you help me out? The doctor writes a prescription, throws it down in the hole, and moves on. Then a psychiatrist comes along, and the guy shouts up, Hey, dude, I'm down in this hole. Can you help me out? Uh, the psychiatrist writes out some good advice, throws it down in the hole, and moves on. This isn't to criticize doctors, I guess. 
<laughs> then a friend walked by. Hey, Joe, it's me. Can you help me out? And the friend jumps in the hole. Our guy says, are you stupid? Now we're both down here. The friend says, yeah, but I've been down here before, and I know the way out. That is the kind of savior we have. Not a savior who lobs religious advice at us from a distance. The savior who is face to face in our suffering and difficulty with us. There is no feeling or difficulty we experience that Christ doesn't have first hand knowledge of. Are you struggling with pain? Christ experienced pain. Whipped, beaten, crucified on the cross for us. Are you experiencing fear? Christ experienced fear so much that he literally sweated blood for fear of what was going to come, but he willingly went to on our behalf. Are you struggling with hurt? Christ experienced hurt. Betrayal? All of his friends left him in his last moments. In the moments he needed his friends most, they headed for the door. Grief? Christ wept for lost friends. He wept for the entire people of God, knowing what they were going to endure in the coming years. We have a deep gospel. One that we don't need to be afraid to be real with our pain and grief. That we need to worry that God can't handle it. Because we have a Savior who did. Who walked through it. Who experienced it face to face. And now, it's face to face with us, arm to arm. His Spirit dwelling inside us that we can walk through very difficult times, knowing that there is the hope to come. And that's how we balance both knowing what God's done for us by still having to wait for what's yet to come. Why? Because we have the Savior who walks with us, who knows that pain, who knows that difficulty, who can carry it on our behalf on his strong shoulders. That is the width and breadth and height of our gospel. Let's go before God in prayer. Lord God, we rejoice to know you. We rejoice to have you in our lives. Uh, we rejoice that we don't need to pretend to be a certain way. That we don't need to whitewash our, our stories or to get our lives together before we can come into your presence. We thank you that you receive us as you are and that you walk up through us, with us, through good, through bad. Because in your gospel there is grace and transformation for every aspect of our lives. Lord, we pray this in your name. Let's stand and sing together.